Welcome back to the last day of this 14-day San Francisco sourdough bread making tutorial. I have to admit that when I thought about trying my hand at a YouTube series to pass the time during lockdown, I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it turned out to be. Don't get me wrong, I'm really glad that I did it though. Probably the best part has been chatting with all of you along the way. I've seen so many starters and loaves from seemingly every corner of the globe, but the real fun has been from learning the backstories along the way. From people who have never been in the kitchen before, to those that were challenged to do this by their friends, to pro chefs who just wanted to apply their skills to a type of bread making they hadn't tried before. And even though I thought I knew this area of sourdough pretty darn well, I've been pushed by you at home to think about things differently. Whether that's from a starter that just didn't seem to want to start, or people who are eager to learn but only had the most basic tools. It's been about adapting and learning as we grew through this series together. Okay, so that's enough looking back. Now, as promised for this video, I want to answer the top few questions that have kept coming up through the series. So number four is for those of you cooking in Dutch ovens. What exactly is the best way to put a loaf in without them going sideways or worse, you getting burnt yourself? It can seem like the old kid's game of operation, but there's actually a really easy way to do it without getting hurt. Just use some baking paper or parchment paper as handles. Just cut your baking paper in a rectangle that's just a little bit bigger than your loaf in one direction. In the other direction, make sure it extends past your loaf for about four inches on either side. Then you just use these long ends as handles to carefully lower your loaf down into your preheated Dutch oven. Then you can just pop the top on and bake it with these handles still inside. When it comes time to take it out, you can use these handles again. But be careful, the baking paper becomes a lot more brittle after being in the oven for that long. Now the reason we have to do this trick is because it's obviously a bit awkward to put a loaf into such a deep pot. That's why specialist bread cooking vessels like this Challenger bread pan are designed to make it a lot easier to load and unload. But if you aren't quite ready to make the investment into a specialist equipment like that, there's a chance you can emulate at least some of what they offer by simply turning your Dutch oven upside down. Not all Dutch ovens can stand up properly upside down, but if yours can, then this is a great way to make it extremely easy to be able to load and unload your loaves, even when it's rip-roaring hot. Okay, for the third most asked question now. Is it okay for you to swap out the white flour for another type of flour? The easy answer is, sure. You can use just about any type of flour you'd like. So the advanced recipe already calls for up to 5% of any type of flour that you find interesting. And this is a great way for you to start putting your own twist on this recipe. From there, just make it your own. If you like the taste of rye, then crank up the percentage and just see how it tastes when it's done. You'll find that your choice of flour does have other impacts on the resulting loaf though, so keep that in mind. Rye flour, for example, has very little gluten, so it won't be able to trap as many bubbles and you'll have a much more dense crumb. That's not to say it'll be worse, just different. So experiment to your heart's content and create your own sourdough recipe that tastes the best to you. Speaking of tweaking the recipe, we come to the second most asked question. Can you add mix-ins into the recipe, and if so, how would you do that? And of course the answer is yes. Since it uses mostly white flour and no overpowering flavors, the San Francisco sourdough recipes make an excellent blank canvas for mixing in just about anything you'd like. Mine and my daughter's favorite is garlic and rosemary. I like to use a combination of both roasted garlic and fresh garlic to give it a much more layered garlic flavor, with fresh milled rosemary coming in as a perfect complement. My wife and son, however, are much more partial to a seeded loaf. Whatever you choose to add in, you'll always do it at the same time, during the first lamination. For those of you who haven't yet tried the advanced recipe, the lamination phase is usually around an hour after the warm bulk fermentation phase starts. You just start the lamination as you normally would, but once it's all spread out, just sprinkle a layer of your mix in all over. Then fold it up as you normally would. This gives a great jump start to getting it evenly distributed throughout the dough but don't worry if it seems like it needs a bit more. Over the next two rounds of stretch and folds, you'll see your mix-ins just melt into your dough. And by the time you go to shape your loaves, they'll be nicely spread throughout, which is exactly how you want them. So now the most asked question of the series is, help, I'm running out of flour, how can I pause my starter? And of course this makes a lot of sense, especially now while we're all in this global lockdown. But even after we're all allowed back out, you're probably not gonna wanna keep feeding your starter twice a day like a hungry pet. So there are two things you can do here. If you want to just slow things down but you still want to be able to bake in a week or two, then your easiest option is to just pop it in the fridge. The safest way to do this is to feed your starter normally, and then wait for an hour for it to take hold before popping it in the fridge. 
Then you can keep it there for usually five to 10 days before you need to feed it again. Just take a look every day and see where it's at. It won't rise much in the fridge though, so you'll need to look for other signs of when to feed it. If you notice any clear liquid on the top, then this is probably hooch and it's a sign you definitely need to feed it right away. And when you take it out of the fridge, your starter's gonna be a bit groggy. So when you refresh it, you're only gonna wanna discard about half of it and then add at least 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water. Then you should leave it on the counter for around an hour again before popping it back into the fridge. So you can see how this approach will really cut down on the flour that you need, but what if you actually have no flour left? Or if you've had fun with this project, but you don't think you'll be picking it back up for a few months? Well, in that case, you can just dehydrate your starter. The ideal time for you to do this is when your starter is just starting to peak. Then you just pour some onto a sheet of baking paper and spread it out nice and thin with a spatula. The thinner it is, the quicker it'll dehydrate. Then you'll want to pop it in the oven with only the lights on. Be careful that it doesn't get too warm in there though, but if it stays under about 33 Celsius or 90 Fahrenheit, then this will be the perfect temperature to let it slowly dehydrate. Then after probably four to 12 hours, you'll find that the moisture has evaporated and you're left with something that looks like this. At that point, you can just peel the flakes off the baking paper and pop them into an airtight bag or container. It'll stay like this pretty much indefinitely, and then when you want to bring it back to life, you just mix in some water and some flour and wait for the bubbles to appear again. Now I'll have to do a more thorough video on this at some point, but until then you can check out my Instagram post from 2018, where I did exactly this before I went on a plane to visit my family in California for Christmas. I rehydrated it a few days later, and by Christmas it was alive and raising loaves again like a champ. So there you have it. That brings us to the end of this video and the end of this series. I really want to thank everyone who followed this series, and a special thanks to everyone that reached out to ask a question or just share experiences along the way. And speaking of sharing, if you learned something during this series, please tap share and challenge one of your friends or family to take on this little adventure next. Okay, so I might take a little break from making videos for a couple weeks, but I'll still be posting and hanging out on Instagram as usual, so please do come connect with me over there as well. So one last big thank you to everyone who made it this far as I stumbled my way through my first YouTube series. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss it when I do end up posting the next video. Until then, I hope you continue to have fun baking San Francisco sourdough bread, and hopefully I'll see you back here again real soon. Bye for now!